<clears throat> so if you think about most people these days and whether they believe that God's existence can be proved, whether they believe in God or not is not the question. Whether they believe God's existence can be scientifically or rationally proved, most people these days will argue, no, God can't be proved. You have to believe God on faith. But this comes not from a recognition that the old proofs for the existence of God don't work, but rather I'm claiming a shift in what counts as knowledge. The theory of knowledge itself is what changed. And that's the major difference between what you're going to say is the modern era and the postmodern era and the pre-modern era. So what was the shift? The shift wasn't in thinking that, okay, we can't use the senses or that reason doesn't work. No, always everybody believed that knowledge is some combination of reason and observation. The difference was what grounded what? What acted as the foundation of the house of knowledge? So if you think of knowledge as a house, because we have beliefs, and knowledge is when what we believe is grounded or justified or founded on something that is certain or something that gives it credentials. So in the ancient era and medieval era, the main emphasis was on reason. And so we can call these theories rationalist theories, rationalism. And the person who first comes up with rationalism is Plato himself. He argued that all of our knowledge of reality comes through reason alone, and that the senses can never give us knowledge. The most they can ever give us is appearances or opinions. And so that's one extreme of rationalism. But rationalism doesn't have to claim that. Rationalism can claim rather that we do get knowledge of facts through the senses, but ultimately all of those sense, those observations must be grounded in rational proof and in principles or laws that only reason can justify. A great example that is always given here is the principle of non-contradiction. All of us believe that a person can't be both pregnant and not pregnant at the same time. Why? Because that's a contradiction. We don't try to prove that contradictions can never occur. We believe that rationally speaking, it makes no sense to believe a contradiction. And so therefore, contradictions can never be true. You don't try to observe to see if a contradiction could ever be true. You believe that reason tells you right away it couldn't be. And so rationalism then is the claim that all of our knowledge ultimately is grounded in reason. Now Aristotle came halfway between Plato and the other people we're going to look at. He believed that a lot of our knowledge comes from the senses, and indeed our knowledge always starts with the senses, but that our rational mind is what ultimately brings us to knowledge of reality, and that there are certain things that can never come through the senses, that we need reason to tell us. This is especially the case for cause and effect. Now, what happens in the modern era is that reason is seen as superfluous, that all of our knowledge actually is grounded in the senses themselves. So there's a famous saying from Locke which says, we have no concept in the mind except what we previously gotten through the senses. And so thus, even our most abstract concepts must be shown to come from the sense data that we get through observation. David Hume is the most extreme proponent of such a view, and he argues that unless we can show where a concept, how it connects to our, the original sense data, then that Oh, that thing cannot be shown to be knowledge. It has to be nonsense. So now, how does this relate to the question of the proofs for the existence of God? We saw that the most popular proof, the proof that was thought to scientifically prove the existence of God, was the cosmological argument. The argument that the universe is an effect of a cause and that the only kind of cause that can produce a universe like ours is God. Now, 
To say this is not to say that the ancients and the medievals believed that the universe, like Genesis says, had a beginning and that it was created in six days. No, not at all. In fact, Aristotle believed that the universe was eternal and that you could prove that there was no beginning to the universe. And Thomas Aquinas, who used Aristotle's proofs, believed that only faith could tell you that the universe had a beginning, that reason is compatible with the universe being eternal. But nonetheless, even if the universe is eternal, it had to be an effect of a cause. Now, how is that possible? Well, when you think of cause and effect, rationally speaking, our concept involves the idea that the cause is always the source of the effect in some sense. This you might call is the influence theory of cause and effect. It's the idea that even when, for example, I'm shooting a game of pool and I hit the white ball and the cue ball and the cue ball then hits the black ball and causes the movement of the other, we can say the reason that happens is because the cause, the cue ball, has motion and then it gives that motion to the eight ball. And so therefore, the cue ball is the source of the motion of the effect of the eight ball. So you notice the idea is of some power that C has, and that C then gives that power or that state of existence to E. And of course, when we're talking about the cause of existence, then what we would say is that if the, even if the universe is eternal, the question is, why would there be a universe at all? Why would there be any operation in the universe? What could cause or be the source of that operation even simultaneously? And the idea is there has to be this source, and this source is what gives existence to the universe, even as an eternal effect. So in this case, what you see here is that all of the proofs for the existence of God depend on this rational concept of cause being the source of the existence and activity of the effect, and that without the cause, there would be no effect. In this kind of concept, what you have is the notion of a simultaneous cause and effect. You ask the question, why is there light? And you point to the sun. The sun doesn't exist before the light. The sun is existing at the same time as the light and is radiating the light. And the reason why we say the sun is the cause of the light is not because one exists before, but rather because one depends on the other. We could take away the light without taking away the sun, but we can't take away the sun without taking away the light. So you notice that if I had that concept of cause and effect, then the proofs for the existence of God make sense, and we don't have to even assume that the universe has a beginning. But when we shift from a rational notion of cause and effect to what we can observe, what do our observations tell us about cause and effect and the source of that concept, we're going to get something totally different. And this is where David Hume comes in. He is the most famous for arguing that our concept of cause and effect can never make sense if we think of it as this transfer or giving of power or existence. So let's go back to playing pool. Here we are playing pool. How do I know that the cue ball is the source of the motion of the eight ball? I don't know it through reason. Just observing the concept of the cue ball doesn't tell me that it has to, when it comes in contact with the eight ball, cause the eight ball to do anything, to even move in a certain motion. Maybe when it hits it, for all reason tells me, the cue ball explodes, or the eight ball goes into the air and floats for a little while, makes a circle, and then dances and sings a song. Reason can't tell me what's going to happen when the cue ball hits the eight ball. Only experience can tell me. And what does experience tell me? It tells me first I observe the motion of the cue ball, then I observe that the cue ball comes in contact with the eight ball, then I observe the eight ball moving. That's all that the senses can tell me. And since all my knowledge comes to the senses, 
including my knowledge of cause and effect, it follows that the only concept I have of cause and effect is this pattern of observation. I observe that first this occurs and then that occurs and that there's a pattern that whenever events of type C occur, then events of type E occur. But then how do I distinguish the cause from the effect? It can't be simultaneous because just observation alone can't tell me which is the cause and which is the effect when both occur at the same time. What tells me that C is the cause and E is the effect is that C always occurs first and then E occurs. And so the idea of cause and effect being simultaneous to each other makes no sense if I'm relying totally on what my senses tell me. The only way I can, through my senses, distinguish the cause from the effect is the fact that the cause is the thing that always occurs first and the effect is the thing that follows immediately after. And so we see a different concept then, don't we? Now what we're going to mean by cause and effect is we always see E follows C according to a set pattern or law. And that is why we call E the effect and C the cause. So once the only thing we can tell about cause and effect is this temporal relation in time and that the cause is just a thing that occurs immediately before the effect and the effect is just a thing that always follows according to some law from the preceding thing that I saw or heard, then I have a completely different concept of cause and effect, don't I? It makes no sense to talk about C being the source of E. All I can ever say is that whenever I observe C, I can be certain to predict that E will come next. How is this going to change what I mean by cause and effect and the cosmological argument? Well, if, first of all, it means that I can make no sense of this simultaneous cause of the universe. To say that the cause must always come before the effect and then admit that the universe is eternal is to basically admit that the universe, according to our empirical concept of cause and effect, can have no cause, no overall cause. As long as I can postulate that for every event that occurs, there's something that occurs before it that makes what occurs follow according to a law, then that's enough. And therefore, the idea that I need this ultimate origin or cause of the universe, that the universe can't simply be this eternal chain of cause and effect, now makes no sense. So you see, it wasn't a shift in the idea that somehow the medievals were ignorant and the modern came around and showed them what was wrong with them, it was actually a shift in where knowledge comes from. Now what we're going to see is how Schopenhauer uses this idea. He's going to show that the minute we agree with this concept of cause and effect, that the cause must always come immediately before the effect, that then we can prove not only do we have no ground for the existence of God, but we actually can prove there can be no first cause and therefore no God.